Good afternoon and welcome to today's BioXL webinar. Um, my name is Adam Carter. I'm from the BioXL project. Uh, so I'm going to give a very brief introduction, um, no more than five minutes, and then I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Michael, who is going to be giving today's webinar on the introduction to the Common Workflow Language Project, the CWL project. Just a quick uh, note to let you know that this webinar is being recorded, including the Q&A session at the end. Um, and so uh, these videos will be posted on YouTube um, after the event, so you can, you can catch up with them there or through our website at BioXL EU. So just a very brief overview of BioXL because we've been going for, for over a year and a half now, so um, many of you will be aware of, of the kind of things that we're doing. But the center of excellence that we're establishing has three sort of main strands. One of them is excellence in biomolecular software. So this is a moment where we have particular focus on three uh, important uh, biomolecular codes. Um, Gromax for molecular dynamic simulations, Haddock for docking, and CPMD, uh, and in particular a QMMM interface uh, for doing those, um, those hybrid modeling uh, calculations. The other, the next main pillar is excellence in usability, and that is sort of related to part of what we're talking about today. And this strand of the project is interested in efficient workflow environments to make um, both the three codes that I've already mentioned and the many other codes that are used uh, in biomolecular research more usable and more usable together. Um, so that is important to us. And the final part of what we're doing is consultancy and training. So uh, this, uh, we do want to build up links with, with you. So if you're interested more about BioXcel, um, do let us know. And in particular, uh, one of the ways that you can get involved is through our interest groups. And we do have a workflows interest group in BioXcel. So presumably if you're here today, you have an interest in workflows. So I'd encourage you to, to sign up um, to that interest group and any of the others that you are interested in. So for most of today's uh, talk, we'll let Michael uh, go through his presentation and then there'll be time at the end for you to ask any questions that you have. The easiest way to do that is for you to use the built-in questions tool in GoToWebinar so you'll be able to type in your question. Uh, when we get to the end, um, if you've got a microphone, I'll invite you to, to um, speak your question directly to, to Michael so that you can uh, have a, a bit of a conversation. Um, otherwise, I'll read out your question and, and Michael will, will answer it. Um, so you can type your question in at any time and then at the end, I can, I can go through the questions that have been typed in. Finally, if you're watching this webinar later on YouTube or if you have a, uh, something occurs to you after the event and you want to continue the discussion or ask questions later, <coughs> we have a forum at ask.bioexcel.eu that you can use um, to, to ask any questions and we can, we can follow up with answers there. So um, today's presenter then, um, Michael Crusoe, is, is one of the co-founders of the CWL project and is now the, the CWL community engineer. He's a former lead developer of um, the KH Mayer project, which is uh, some software for advanced bi bi biological sequencing data analysis, if you're, you're not aware of that. But his previous career was as a sysadmin and a programmer. He's had many contributions to various free and open source software communities. And he's also done some previous work um, on standards projects, um, which he might mention a bit later on in his talk as well. Um, uh, he's previously partnered with Elixir and other European research products, projects to promote CWL. So as I'm sure you'll agree, he's in a very good place to, to introduce to you today what CWL is all about and why it might be of interest to you. So at this stage, then I will hand over to, to Michael and um, Michael, I think you should be able to, to take it from here. Thank you so much, Adam, for the introduction, and I hope my sound is coming through well. Uh, yep. As a quick reminder, uh, I'm on Twitter, and there is an official CWL hashtag, and since it's public in y'all, my normal disclaimer that this is a public presentation is a bit redundant. If Adam closes that notification, you'll notice in the upper right-hand corner there is a short link to get the slides, and feel free to share them. Uh, 
uh, Adam's being my hands today, so he's going to advance to the next slide. And just a, a quick repeat of a bit of my background. But the short story is, is that uh, I enjoy speaking with and working with both biologists, uh, computer system engineers, sysadmins, and I have some previous experience doing standards and community work. Uh, and it's really exciting to get to be able to combine all these pieces in support of standardizing how we represent workflows in a research context. Which brings me to the next slide where we should just define this word real quick. It's probably this crowd knows it, but I like to always make sure clear that when I talk about workflows, I'm referring to in the context of computational data analysis, the collection of programs and scripts and source code um, that researchers and scientists use to analyze their data. And so a workflow is all of these things together, and it's also the connections between them and how they're configured. In fact, many workflows are in, in themselves as complex as any other piece of code. Um, and that's why they're kind of worth talking about. Um, so anybody who's done any research of a certain complexity or a certain scale um, might get to a point where they need some sort of system to help manage the execution of this code, whether it's because um, there are many details or maybe they just need to do, uh, you know, use a large computing resource. We call these things workflow management systems. I like to highlight the different features one can find um, to help kind of motivate the use of them. But I also like to remind people earlier in your research, you should probably do something so formal uh, in a new type of research. I think being messy is really useful. But when it's time to be more organized, the separation of concerns that a workflow management system can give you uh, is just really helpful to be able to focus on the research question and, and achieving those goals or exploring the possibilities. And then separately, um, getting the, the actual implementation to execute and to be optimized. For some people, they might have both of those conversations, but sometimes you'll have different staff working on different parts of that. So a good workflow management system will give you that separation of concerns. Um, obvious, sort of an obvious big feature is that you can run your complicated workflow, these many steps, many programs, handing off parts automatically uh, on a cluster or cloud or other computing resource and not have to, you know, start and stop each uh, part of the process separately. Um, several workflow management systems will even give you a graphical user interface for uh, in the Galaxy workflow system, popular in biological contexts, but also found elsewhere, um, is a well-known example of that. And then a, a feature I think is really key, but I would like to see implemented more widely is provenance, the, the answer to the question, how was this file made? So these are all features uh, that I recommend people keep in mind when they shop for workflow management systems. And in fact, it, on the next slide um, are, is a, a reproduction of a list I've been maintaining, uh, collecting which workflow management systems are used out in research. And as we continue, we see it's a very long list. Uh, and it keeps going and going. In fact, there's 122 uh, I know about, and I suspect that I'm off by a couple hundred. So hopefully this gives everybody a sense of motivation for why we had a standard. Why, we, why did we talk about standards in the first place? There are all these great workflow systems used by different communities, uh, servicing some slightly different needs. Um, but People, you know, it, it, it gets in the way of us reproducing each other's work and of reusing each other's work. So I think a good standard can, um, you know, there's good and bad standards, and a good standard can create this, this surface for collaboration and innovation, both between individuals, but also between the people who develop these systems. Um, and the reality is, is you can't just have one uh, approach. You know, I get this comment back, or you sort of see this out there. Well, of course, you know, there's all these other systems, who cares? I've solved all the problems with my new system, number 123, and everybody should just use that. And that, it's not realistic, it's just not gonna happen. Um, and then kind of finally, uh, on, on this thought, is that funders and journals and other sources of the incentives are never gonna pick a single or proprietary approach. So 
standards are good from a policy standpoint. Um, so now I, I, you know, happy to introduce the common workflow language. So it's not a project, it's not a platform or something installed or you purchase. It's a standard developed in a community open way for describing uh, workflows and their components and how the data flows through them. So that as many of those 122 plus systems, if they want to, can share the work of researchers between them and, and move around and enable greater collaboration. It came from the bioinformatics community, but we've worked very hard to not make it specific at all uh, to the bioinformatics. And we've seen adoption um, across many domains, radio astronomy, digital humanities, uh, image analysis, and beyond. But if you're in bioinformatics, it scratches a lot of itches. And I think uh, that community maybe has a greater need. Uh, extensibility is very important to us. We deliver a formal schema, kind of a more uh, Cuban-oriented specification made from that, and a test suite so that various platforms can, conform, can confirm their conformance to the standard. A standard is nothing without implementations. Um, and because of the background of the people involved with this effort, uh, we know that people, ex you know, researchers execute their their data analysis in all sorts of environments. I'm going to do it on my laptop for some things. I might run a run on a cluster or a cloud, big HPC system. And the model we have built um, really reflects a flexibility that doesn't get in the way of any of that. Uh, lately, you've probably heard a lot about software containers like Docker, which um, can simplify sharing of software configuration the reproducibility of a certain build of software and installation. Uh, and we really support this trend, uh, and it's an optional thing to use, but the, uh, Docker support is first class in CWL. On my next slide, uh, we've got you know, the famous you know, wall of logos. Um, and this is kind of exciting for me, because this project began at a code fest nearly three years ago at the Bioinformatics Open Source Conference, and uh, myself, kind of representing the tool author perspective and users, and then three engineers from, from various different platforms. So Peter Amstutz from Curiverse with their Arbados platform, John Chilton, who's one of the core engineers for the Galaxy project, and Boisha Chidanek from Seven Bridges, um, uh, all said, you know, we've got these different systems and that's a good thing. And let's see what we can do to find this common ground to model how, not all the ways you could design a workflow, but the ways that are commonly found. And along the way, we've learned about prior efforts and got to reuse work from lots of uh, great projects and found uh, enthusiastic early adopters and implementers, um, some of which who have their logos here. We're really excited about additional contributors, whether um, it's uh, training, documentation, use, describing tools, all sorts of contributions. And so uh, we'd love to have more partners on board. Um, and just on the next slide here, I just give a quick shout out to uh, all those people I mentioned and some of our additional contributors. Our 1.0 standard came out last June um, after a couple different drafts. And we're about to release 1.0.1, just some minor tweaks, just to formalize, um, we've, you know, it's great getting 1.0 out because you learned what you missed. And so we had some, as the implementations caught up, we had some clarifications we were formalizing. 1.1 is likely to be released uh, well, well before the end of the year. And again, some pretty minor things. We have a 2.0 cooking with some bigger breaking changes, but we always uh, offer upgraders that will upgrade the syntax from one version to the next. Um, so just a little bit about process and how we run the project on the next slide. As I mentioned, we began at a code fest, uh, which is like a relaxed hackathon, and that sort of open source ethos permeates the project. So we run the whole project as publicly as we possibly can. Decisions are made publicly. It is free to participate, to adopt, to implement, um, and the logo is, is freely licensed as well. Uh, one of the commercial partners sponsored me to move it from nights and weekends to a full time. And uh, so now I work as the community engineer. 
uh, supporting the project and, and providing uh, assistance in, in many ways. Um, a little bit about how we develop this. Um, on the next slide, I talk about community-based standards development. Sometimes people get a little concerned when they hear about standards. They may have had some bad experiences. And so we, we kind of had our own take on things, and we discovered this other this sort of statement on how to do standards that actually matched the way we do it, which is it's like running an open source project. Uh, so if any, anybody who's watching on the call or on YouTube does anything with standards, I really recommend checking out this open-stand.org website. Um, and uh, I think it's a, a great vision and that we work hard to implement on voluntary adoption, you know, this freeness about being consensus-based. You know, there are uh, other workflow specifications and uh, proprietary approaches, but what makes a standard, in my mind, is this community aspect and having many implementations. I think that's really key. Um, so moving on, just talking about some design principles. Uh, we want it to be easy to be implemented, right? There's a standard is nothing without people making use of it. Uh, we, we knew that it had to be um, well-structured enough to support generation of workflow descriptions from code, um, also to create graphical user interfaces or to convert between formats. We didn't want to get in the way of anybody doing more than what we had described in the standard, so we support and really promote anybody adding an extension to try out a new idea, and it is now actually the mechanism for proposing changes to the language is that it's implemented as a single system specific extension to prove out the idea. Then we invite other uh, implementers to, to have their take on, on it. Uh, and then it gets matured into the, the formal spec, perhaps as an optional feature or later as a mandatory feature, depending on uh, how it fits in there. We think linked data is also really uh, important. Uh, and I'll give an example of that later. And pragmatism is, is pretty key to us as well. So I mentioned linked data, and on the next slide, um, uh, you know, I, I get to use linked data as a way that we can both be not specific to any particular field, but still um, reuse uh, perhaps a, a certain domain's uh, expert knowledge. For example, in bioinformatics, we have lots of different file formats. We make new file formats all the time as a hobby, it seems. And, um, so keeping track of them and the relations to them, you know, is this file format just a subset of this other? Um, it's pretty difficult to do. Some, some projects will do this in code, um, and, but luckily this group called, that's made this EDEM ontology, has uh, this control vocabulary and ontology that describes the, what these file formats are and the relationships to them. And in CWL, you can plug this in. So if you're using bioinformatics, you should use the EDEM ontology. And if your file format of choice isn't listed there, you should contact them. You know, they have like a monthly release cycle. And if you're from another field, you can develop your own vocabulary around this. Um, so you can reason about file formats. Like, oh, my tool can work on any tab separated, you know, uh, value thing, uh, file. It's pretty generic. But this file format I have here is, you know, a specialization of that. So getting those relationships. Um, Moving onward, as an example, I've been working um, in the middle of a, a short-term contract, working with the European Bioinformatics Institute and, and being co-funded by Elixir. Um, to uh, Elixir's paint for some training material that I'm developing, and EBI uh, under Rob Finn's of Genomics Group um, has, uh, is going through a process of converting their existing uh, sort of. Um, mature production pipeline into uh, CWL. So the production pipeline is sort of battle hardened for their particular uh, uh, grid planner, but they would like a more generic description that's still performant, but easier to maintain and understand. Uh, so I've been assisting them with that. We've been doing it all in the open. It's on GitHub. Uh, so we invite anybody to, to go take a look at that. And uh, we really took dramatically reduced the, the number of the complexity in the description, um, so it's easy to browse and visualize. In fact, on the next slide, you'll see a visualization made possible thanks to the University of Manchester uh, uh, undergraduate, though actually I think he might have just graduated, uh, working under Stan Solanreyes, 
the common CWL viewer, you can visualize any CWL workflow. What I like about this slide is it helps demonstrate uh, that not only does CWL help with executing or reproducibility, but I think it is, helps to something that's much more key, is reuse, reusability. I think that's actually more important than reproducibility. It's, um, it gives the opportunity to describe uh, as we go our intent, the, the logical process happening you know, uh, make files and other approaches are great, and, and I use them all the time, but it can be hard to kind of figure out what was the intent of this chunk? What is this step trying to do? And in CWL, you can label these. In fact, the main identifiers are meant to be human readable. So we see in this visualization here, the orange uh, uh, nodes on the graph actually represent whole sub workflows. And we've actually tried to give them a descriptive name so that somebody working in this domain, in metagenomics, for example, would kind of be able to quickly understand what we're going on. And in fact, through the viewer interface, if you were to click on that link below, you can even scroll down and click through the, uh, uh, we won't do a demo now, but, you, but I invite everybody else to, to go look at this, and you can even click through and see the sub-workflows and explore the process and the thinking there. Um, so that's, uh, it's been a very rewarding experience, and we know many other groups are doing this as well to help better organize um, what is often, you know, a pile of different scripts people use to kind of cope if they're not using a more formalized system like Galaxy, Taverner, or Canine. Um, and then uh, if anybody's out there using uh, CWL on Toil, which is one of our implementations, I've got some notes up. Um, I invite people to click through. Um, so since you know, specifications, there's always this interplay between specs and implementations. Toil is very popular for use on high performance computing clusters. Uh, but, and we really appreciate that. There's a few rough corners, and as a community, we've been working together to polish them off. Uh, and uh, in my travels um, explaining and promoting CWL, you know, I've been trying to build a network of, of people doing this. And so we've, we've seen a lot of community contributions uh, to this one particular implementation. Um, so each backend is a little bit different with Toil, but if, some, if you'd like to read about my experiences running Toil on the LSF scheduler, uh, this link here gives all the gory details. But big, uh, big appreciation to that project. Uh, no code shaming here. So taking a step back from this sort of very pragmatic uh, experience, I do want to give us a bigger picture on things one can do with CWL. Um, so I mentioned reproducibility and re reusability. One thing that gets me very excited is seeing this collaboration both within very big institutes where that might not happen, but regionally, cross regions, and now globally. So for example, there is a description of the GTK pipeline, uh, an older version of that, of that published pipeline, using CWL that was began by some graduate students at the University of Melbourne. Uh, using a very early draft of CWL. That work was picked up by participants at the Pan-African Bioinformatics Network, H3A Bionet, uh, upgraded to the latest CWL syntax. And I know we've got users and contributors across Africa and Europe and North America now and beyond. But this one workflow. And that's something I've never really seen before for various, mostly technical, but sometimes social reasons. And I think removing those technical barriers so you can focus on the social barriers of collaboration is a pretty neat thing. We're also seeing contests and challenges use CWL. Uh, so dream challenges, that's all caps of periods. Um, and uh, one thing that I've promoted, I don't know if it's happening yet, but I think it's a really great possibility is dealing with non-public data sets. So maybe there's privacy concerns or it's proprietary for most, for some other reasons, but this sort of remote execution, bringing the compute description to where the data is, um, could be handy for all sorts of situations. One could also imagine, you know, in a biomedical context, you don't want to fill out all that paperwork just to get access to a resource that may not even have the data you need. Uh, but what if you could submit, you know, a little program that would tell you if anything was there of all of interest? Uh, it could even be audited by the remote people. Um, so you could figure out, should you, you know, build this relationship or sign the paperwork? So on the next few slides, um, so looks like I have some time. I'm just going to quickly go through a little bit of the syntax to give you a, a taste of it. 
So underlying in CWL are these tools we want to run. And before we can build a workflow out of them, we have to describe uh, these, these tools, these scripts, uh, maybe a function or a whole program. Um, and so there's not really a, there weren't really existing standards in this space. Um, so what we've done is take a command line oriented view. So if you could run it at the command line, which is basically anything, you know, in Unix or a POSIX environment, you can run it in CWL. And so this basic component is how we still have to be able to describe how to run this command line program. So what will the inputs be? We can have type information around that. And then how to run the program, so how to go from the inputs to the command line. And then finally, how to consume the output of that program. So in this example here, I've, I've, I've colored, and I'll go through the sections. We see that the CWL syntax is YAML-based. So that's like a, a more human-friendly version of JSON, JSON, if you've heard of that. That allows us to have comments, like we do in that middle green section, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, and, and before we go forward, that bottom part of the screen, we actually see the use of that external uh, namespace and that external vocabulary. So we'll reuse this, this uh, EDEM ontology, so which they get to innovate at their own speed. And so as they improve that, uh, you know, those benefits come to the CDBEL descriptions. So in this instance, we'll use EDAM because it has this great registry uh, and identifiers for bioinformatic file formats. On the next slide, we'll sort of start breaking this apart piece by piece. So, you know, uh, we've got some key value pairs. We're saying, yep, this is a command line tool. It's a CWL file. Here's the version of the spec it's referring to. Always, we encourage people to document uh, what they're describing, though it's, it's optional. And uh, I've already mentioned plugging in the external libraries, the external vocabularies for metadata. On the next screen, I get an excuse to talk about Docker. Uh, on the, and so here, um, in the, you know, we were actually going to say, you know, there's a Docker container out there that already has this command. So what we're describing today is a program called SandTools and has a subcommand called sort. And I was able to reuse a, a Docker container that was already public. I shortened the URL for this slide, but um, on the previous slides, it was uh, fully expanded. And this is also a demonstration of our extensibility feature. So we're, um, you could imagine extensions to the languages, the, the, the CWL language itself, like a performance hint or some other optimization that doesn't change the fundamental execution, but is useful for maybe only one system. Those could go in this hints uh, uh, section of the document, but there could be a requirement section. Maybe you've developed an extension that does fundamentally change how to interpret the file. We still welcome people to do that within the file format of CWL, just that they flag this in the requirements section. On the next slide, we'll go in and look at the input section. Um, so again, we're, we're, we're treating this tool like a user-defined function, right? So we have to have our inputs and outputs. In the input section, we give names of the inputs we're going to have. These are names that are meaningful to humans. And they may be even different names than used by the tool, right? This sometimes is an opportunity to improve upon what are often very difficult to use command line programs that we find in research software. Uh, here we'll say, you know, it's going to be a file. We're reusing the EDAM uh, identifiers. Uh, and like many good identifier systems, the identifier itself is not very friendly. So we can use that comment there to remind us ourselves that format underscore 2572 is this BAM, B-A-M binary, excuse me, binary format. And then this next thing is, is a little unusual. We're going to improve the wording of this in the future. Input binding is all about how do I take my inputs for this tool and make it show up in the command line. In this toy example here, it's pretty easy. We're just going to end up putting the file name right after we, you know, we would type the command name. So we just say, here's the position it's going to show up in the command line. And that's, you know, there are default rules about how to represent a file. We're going to give that path. We have many other types of data. We can include all sorts of custom records as well. So on the next slide, we will kind of come back to that summary here so we can just kind of see the big picture. And I'm going to combine the first four boxes here to show you how we take a CWL description and make it into a command line like you would execute yourself. So continuing on, we're going to introduce a new concept. That's the idea of an input object. So the formalism of CWL being a declarative description of command line tools and the workflows made from it 
uh, allows for many different ways to consume that data. So if someone's working at the command line themselves who's running a CWL workflow, they'll need to provide an input object. And you'll notice kind of a one-to-one -one correspondence with that input section. So if there were many different inputs, we'd have many different entries here. The names would match. Wherever we have a type, you know, we'll have the class, the actual, uh, to indicate, you know, maybe there was multiple types it could have been. We'll say which class, which instance we actually are using here. And uh, we'll use the full version of the file format. Um, and uh, we can give the example or a path. Sorry, for this example input, we can give the path or the location of where to find that file. However, other users of CWL might be working from a graphical user interface or over an API, and they would represent this, the inputs by clicking and uh, you know, dragging or filling out a form or some other way. So we're going to take this input object. We're going to take our input section. We have this base command. So the stuff on the right was from the, the, the full description. So the SAM tools command actually has a subcommand we're calling. And for those who are familiar with how Unix works at a lower level, you will recall that command lines are really just an array of strings when they, when they get executed. And that's what we're creating here. So the, if I was typing, I would type SAM tools, sort, and then the path to my file, which is in here example.bam. And you can see how we take this sort of structured approach to make that command line. It's a bit more verbose than other things, but the structured declarative format enables that graphical user interface generation, conversions between file formats, and those other key uh, features that were core to the design of CWL. We, of course, in these early days, lots of people will be writing and are writing CWL by hand. Uh, but we anticipate and would prefer that people wouldn't necessarily have to. So we're trying to make the language both featureful um, and, and easy to parse, but also easy on humans. But we fully expect that most people won't be looking at this syntax in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, on the next slide, uh, we get to talk about, you know, so the command ran and executed it, and how we're going to pull that back into the rest of the system. Because we need to make connections between the inputs and outputs of the various steps. So some workflow systems uh, like Make or things inspired by Make and Make Files use special file form uh, file name patterns to keep track of things, and I think that works great on the small scale. Again, I, I use Make Files all the time, but that doesn't scale ultimately. You tend to put a, too much of your metadata in your file names, and it becomes hard to understand and communicate that to other people. The maintenance burden on such approaches is high. So in CWL, we have this output section to say we're going to give human friendly names to a generic execution of this tool and we'll figure out how to, to get the tool's output. So in this instance we're going to have a file and it's going to pull from the standard output stream of the tool. So we have a little shortcut to make that easy. Um, if it was just a file on disk we have ways of saying you know here's the, uh, the exact file name or a pattern to search for. Um, we can even consume you know, whole directories or arrays of files. Um, and then to be friendly, because a downstream tool might need it, we'll even tag it with a file format. For the SAM tool sort, the SAM tool sort command that I've been using as an example, it outputs the same file format it consumes. So we use the same EDAM tag here. So whew, I hope you've all been following. So that was an example of describing a command line tool in CWL. It's a bit of work. We anticipate that, uh, you know, obviously we don't want to repeat this work, so we, we're working with the various communities to uh, reuse these descriptions, to donate them to the original tool authors, or otherwise package them if, if it, that maintenance isn't happening. And uh, in a side hat I have, I volunteer with the Debian Linux distribution packaging bioinformatics software, and we've started to include CWL descriptions um, and give them to the original authors, just like we would include other contributions like manual pages or uh, other assistance. So it is called the Common Workflow Language. On the next slide, we finally get to talk about like workflows and how we represent them. And we model a workflow in this way. It's called data flow. So data flow doesn't mean step one, step two, step three. It's a data-centric approach. A workflow is modeled as the connections specific named connections of a named output from one step flowing into the named output input of another step. Now, this flow is mostly conceptual, though uh, in CWL you can mark your inputs and outputs as being streaming capable. 
which means an implementation can optimize by not writing that data to disk and truly letting the data flow from one step to another. We have a, a nifty parallelism uh, feature called Scatter, Scatter Gather, to run the same step um, in the same way, but varying you know, an input or some other parameter. Um, and any workflow can be a step in another workflow. Lots of people ask about conditionals and looping. We don't have that in 1.0. We've got some proposals. And like I said, if that, as it gets implemented and, and proven out, that may make it in as an optional or perhaps someday a mandatory feature of, of a future version. So let's look at some work, uh, CWL workflow. On the next slide, we see an example workflow in two columns. The underlying tool definitions for the tools we're using here, which is the Unix grep command for searching files for text within a file, and the UX WC, the word count command, they, they still have a full tool definition, like I showed before, but they're going to be an external file, which I'm not going to go over today. Uh, so here, I just want to go through the connections uh, and explain how this flows. So much like the command line tool, uh, you know, we say class workflow, it's got inputs, it's got outputs, but instead of having, you know, a base command and input bindings, output bindings, we have the step section. So on the next slide, uh, I will walk us through the flow here. So we've got some arrows. And, and just as a, a note to the side, I put this in two columns. Obviously, uh, the file format is, is continuous, so it's just to ease of visualization. So normally, uh, this, the order of these sections doesn't matter, but yeah, they would go side by side. You'd have the, you know, the steps perhaps after the inputs or after the output section. So what you might ask, like again, how is the order of, that the workflow is run? Yeah, that step section, you know, has a linear list there, uh, and it happens to be in the order it would be executed, but indeed the, the order is inferred by these connections. So let's look at first the overall inputs for this workflow. We're going to take in a, a single string, which we've labeled pattern, and we're going to use that to search over uh, a, a bunch of files. So we have this array, these square bracket with the file notation means it's going to be an array or a list if you want to think of it that way. And that's conceptually what we're going to do here. We're going to search each file, see if our string is there, and then we're going to also count how many matches we had, because that's how the grep command works. It's going to print each match it finds. We'll run the word count command on the grep output to see how many uh, results we found. And you know, this is a toy example. So we're going to, you know, we could have done this simpler, but we're going to take that output from the word count command, and then that will be our overall output. So we see under on the right there, there's the grep section. We've given them kind of names. We could have named it better, right? We could have said, instead of grep colon on that second line under steps, it could have been search file, right? It could have been a bit more friendly. The run directive just says where to find that, the underlying description of how to run that command. Could have been inline here in the text, but for reuse, you know, we don't want to have to write that grep describer more than once. So it's an external file, the CWL description of grep. In that input section under grep, we list the inputs that we're going to provide on the left and where to get them on the right. And here, so grep needs a pattern, great. We've got a workflow level pattern. And that's that first blue arrow going from the input section to the pattern of under the grep step. And likewise, the grep tool wants a single file. Oh, but you know, we've got this array of files. So there's a bit of a mismatch there. And that's where we're going to use the scatter feature to run the grep step once for each of the input files. Uh, maybe on some systems that will be run in parallel or across the cluster, or other systems it might just run them sequentially one after the other. And the final section of that grep stanza is out, listing all the outputs we actually are going to care about. You could imagine executing a big tool in a remote system Maybe there are many outputs, many of them very large, and you only cared about a few of them. So we just list the ones we do care about, um, though in practice we tend to list all of them. So we'll probably clean that up in a future version of the standard. So just like the grep command, the WC stanza looks pretty similar, so we point to a different tool definition. It takes in a whole array, and even though the grep command didn't produce an array of outputs uh, of, of these matches where that text was found, that scatter feature will run it, you know, run all those uh, instances of grep for each uh, input file, and then automatically wrap those outputs in arrays. So we'll get that array of the matches, the, the list of, of where the, the text was found, 
we'll run the word count command on it, and it'll give us a single file, which will then become the overall output of this workflow. In this generic example, we've used very generic names, so pattern, in files, out file, you know, grep and wc. Uh, but a good CWL description actually would use very meaningful names to whoever that audience was. Uh, so I really encourage you not to follow this example, but to actually think about meaningful names. So, so really it should be word counter, it should be the name of that step. It didn't have to match the name of the underlying command. So that was just a taste of what a workflow works, looks like in the underlying syntax. But you know, the point of CWL is not the syntax as much as this agreement, this community that's formed, that cares about sharing workflows between different systems. So we think we've done something useful. And on the next slide, we get to think about the challenges of kind of moving forward with this. Carol Goebel, I stole this phrase from her, of something being freeze in puppies. And we have heard something being freeze in beer, freeze in speech, or liberty. But now we've gotten freeze in puppies. Whoever loves a puppy. But you know, you got to care and feed that. So it's been something I've been spending my time uh, working on. And we're forming a foundation in, uh, as part of an existing 501c3. It's kind of a legal form of a, a, this particular charity or nonprofit NGO in the United States. Um, and so we're, we're building sustainability for this effort and hoping to grow the community. And also there's some related efforts. And on my next slide, I talk about, um, just as a little teaser, this researchobject.org. This is a great standard for describing, it's almost like a data container, a data manifest for the outputs of the research process. And you know it's been around a while. Uh, and I think this was just a standard, an idea that was way ahead of its time and is now really needed in instilling a useful purpose. And so we, you know, we've been talking with that group and there's some overlap. And we really think some combination of these two is really going to fulfill that dream you know, of being able to download a great paper, getting excited about the, the work they did. But you know, I, I always want to play with a, a nice idea with my own data, right? Reproduce the least, fine and all, but I want to reuse it. And I think research object uh, is going to, some combination of that, some future evolution of both of these standards is really going to fill that role for, you know, no more, you know, uh, scripts pasted into spreadsheets printed as PDFs as supplemental materials to research papers. You know, real machine readable, properly described, complete description of how people have gotten the results in the, in the published literature. So that's kind of the big vision of where we're going. Um, so just as a little wrap up here, you know, what, kind of talk about little, what's next. We've got implementations uh, existing and more implementations are coming. And uh, we'll continue to grow the standard, work with others in the area. And we're really excited that the uh, ecosystem is improving. We saw a, a picture of the, the visualizer um, you know, rumor has it that there's going to be a, a, a nice interactive editor, graphical editor workflows being released at the Bioinformatics Open Source Conference next month. That's from the Rabbix team from Seven Bridges, so you can poke around and find that and, uh, if you want to now. Um, so lots of exciting things are happening in CWL land. So I just want to say finally, thanks everybody for, for listening in. I hope this is informative. Um, please check out the website. The user guide is a great introduction. Uh, they'll kind of step you through starting uh, out. Um, also the viewer, view.commonwl.org is a great way to sort of see what other people are doing. There's a built-in gallery of every CBL workflow that's been submitted to that service for, for visualization. So Adam, did we get any questions? Right, well let me uh, open the floor then. Um, so if anyone does have a question, they can they can type it into the, the box now and I will convey that to, to Michael. Um, in the meantime, while the questions are coming in, um, I, ha I had one other question that uh, I was going to, to ask you and that sort of relates to the, the, the point that you made about how you hoped in the future that, that people wouldn't be, be writing the kind of code that you've been showing us um, by hand. Uh, uh, that, that's the sort of vision for where we'd like to get to. Uh, as things currently stand, do you sort of have a recommendation to people who are actively working with workflows? Do you think, do you see that there is value 
to them at the moment in writing those files by hand or should they be looking to some of the tools like Galaxy that you've mentioned that that will will implement this as a as a standard do you have any view on the kind of approaches that people should take yeah good. it's a great question and a, a common one it really depends on where their needs are um, obviously leader adopters get nicer tools uh, but if there is this if you're finding in your project uh, you know a need for collaborating across institutions now or you would like your workflow to not be specific to any one system no, despite how great that might be, uh, that particular system might be, uh, yeah, then uh, using CWL now will provide you with a lot of benefit. Um, uh, but you know, there's, you know, you might have to do a little bit more work than if you had waited a year or two. Um, I, you know, I, I write the tool definitions by hand. Um, I don't know if that's going to be a part of the, the Rabix composer um, that Seven Bridges has written uh, under their open under an open source license and, and made freely available. Though they're still polishing it, so just as a disclaimer, it's, they haven't f formally released it yet. Uh, but I think it's great for workflow editing. Uh, you know, the Galaxy workflow editor and, and others have really shown just for visualization and, and understanding and editing that that graphical way is, is the way to go. So as that you know, that's just a couple months off from being fairly polished. Um, it is usable today, the, the Rabix Composer. Um, but that ability to move between execution systems, to write a CWL workflow on your laptop, run it on a, on a grid, or then run it on a cloud system, and maybe those are completely different backends, that's really powerful, and there are very few systems that have that sort of feature set. So it's, a, it's about your needs, and we all have to, you know, we each have to make these timing decisions with new, new technologies. Thank you very much. I think that's a useful answer. Um, so we don't have any other questions on the floor at the moment. Um, I, I should point out that, you, I mean, they can be questions. They could also just be general comments that you'd like to make about the, what you've heard today or, or the way that you're using workflows or, or not using workflows at the moment. Um, so if you do want to make a question, then do just uh, feel free to type it in. Otherwise, uh, I do have at least one more up my sleeve. Any more from the floor? Because I don't want to, to hog this. Now, so my next question then, while people are, are thinking, um, there is a growing movement to be doing more documenting of of the work that you have done when so when you publish a paper you're now expected to sort of publish the, the data that goes alongside it and to some extent uh, the the software you've used I think that's maybe lagging a little bit behind do you, do you think do you see sort of workflows and software sitting side by side there or do you expect more and more people to be publishing workflows in the future and it, and if so do you do you think there's any any momentum behind any, any particular standard for doing this or at the moment is it just a case of getting people to share and then you can work out the details later? <laughs> well work out the details later is always the tricky bit. You know with CVL I have to describe it as we're trying to help people do the right thing and in the wet environments this shared understanding of what the level of details needed is is, is pretty you know well established. Um, but in the digital realm, we're, we're not doing a good job. You really need to know every scrap of code that was used beyond the and which operating system, right? So you really need, you know, you need to record these details because they can't matter. You need to know every script, every program, the version of that program. Uh, if you made a change, then you know you have to archive that someplace and all the parameters. And uh, a lot of systems. Uh, you know, either the work wasn't done in such a structured fashion or this information wasn't retained. Uh, it would be tedious to type in by hand. I, I understand why people don't report this information. So the, the, the research object standard that I alluded to, um, and I've got that backup slide if you want to pull it up about it, um, is a great way to really communicate. You know, here's a, a table, a figure, um, some other output could be a, a molecular model. Uh, and, but giving that whole story. 
So it also says who's, who's, here's who did the work, here's the workflow that produced it, whether that was CWL or they have a, an abstract but non-executable representation um, uh, of, of a generic workflow. So you can do it both ways. If you have your native CWL, you should do that. But let's say you used a different system that's not yet exporting to CWL. You can still include that proprietary description and this abstract representation that includes all those great details I talked about, right? Which program, which version, which command line options. Uh, you know, the same for uh, other services. So um, I don't know if you can switch over to my slides to show the second to the last, my backup slide about research object. It's one more. Here we go. And so I, I think, uh, yeah, back one. Um, I think it's... Uh, Not that way, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> the other... <laughs> I think this, you know, we when we found this, um, they were they were, you know, this is the metadata um, provenance uh, attribution model people should be using, and we thought about putting a lot of this in our standard, and then it became clear that there's no reason to duplicate that. CWL should be one of the things that goes inside your research object. Okay, that makes lots of sense. And so, I mean, a benefit though of this, right? So we also get software citations. Right. So, for example, like Galaxy, you can export all the, even as BibTeX format, I think, all the, the citations for all the tools you used in your workflow. And even if you did exploratory data analysis, you can kind of extract that workflow post-factual and, and get this uh, list of citations. And in our object model, we include the ability to include identifiers for the software as well, which would allow any other system to do the same trick of saying, oh, okay, you've you run this thing, here's the citations for all the software used. It's not, it's not a feature I showed on the screen, but it's in the specification. Great, thank you. Well, it does look like we don't have any other questions um, for you today. I think uh, maybe that's partly as a result of a nice clear presentation, um, but I'm sure if people do have a question later on, I can remind them that they can go to the BioExcel website and um, uh, I'm going to ask bioexcel.eu and you can leave a question there and we can make sure that either we can answer it or we can pass it to Michael and follow up. Okay, thank you all very much for coming along today. Um, the next uh, webinar, we do expect to have another one next month, um, so keep an eye on the, the webinar pages of BioExcel uh, to, find out, to find out more. Thank you all and thanks to Michael again today and we'll hopefully see you all again soon. Bye. Cheers.